Uh, good evening, colleagues, and uh, uh, good morning if you are in another part of the world. Uh, first of all, allow me to express my gratefulness to the organizers for uh, uh, allowing us uh, a space to share with you some of our activities uh, uh, in the field. So my talk today is uh, titled Size Effects and Quantum Mechanic Governed Phenomena in Nanosystems. So as I mentioned last time also, this work uh, that I am presenting to you or sharing with you uh, uh, is done within the framework of the, uh, the UNESCO chair, the UNESCO UNISA uh, Itamba Labs Africa Chair in Nanosciences and Nanotechnology, which is a partnership between the United Nations Education Scientific Culture Organization and uh, uh, the University of South Africa, as well as Itamba Labs, which is a national patient of South Africa. Uh, well, uh, for those who uh, maybe were not present uh, our last uh, talk, I will not go through it, but what, uh, what is sure is that in terms of bio uh, and activities of the UNESCO chair, the, I sent you the, I sent the full copy to uh, Professor Asamagan. Uh, if you wish to have it, please do so. And if you want to reach us for uh, a visit to us in South Africa, we will be delighted Yulia is with me by using these uh, uh, e emails. Uh, the outline of my talk today uh, is split in six uh, components. The first one, I will just give an overview about the U2 ACN2. And after a short uh, 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 discussion or short uh, summary on the historical background about the nanosciences, from where we came to where we are heading. And certainly you would guess that the, the artificial intelligence is, or the nano is a part of it. And after I will highlight the beauty of the field of nanosciences uh, with some typical examples whereby quantum mechanics at room temperature can be observed and can be tested. And at the end, I would like, uh, if you allow me uh, to uh, share with you more or less some of my views about uh, the, f the future of uh, nanosciences and nanotechnology. So in terms of uh, uh, number one, that is UNESCO, UNISA Africa Chair in Nanosciences, is uh, uh, it's a chair that I am holding currently. It's a really fantastic platform uh, via which we interact extensively with our colleagues from the south and from the north uh, and allowing us more or less to uh, voice uh, Africa in general in the field of, uh, in this hot topic, uh, multidisciplinary field of nanosciences and nanotechnology. The mission of this chair, this Africa chair in nanosciences and nanotechnology, uh, headquartered at the University of South Africa, but having two groups, one in the Cape Town at Itamba Labs uh, and the other one in uh, Pretoria at the uh, Science Campus of UNISA. Its mission is uh, human capital development and training of uh, uh, post grads at the level of MSc and PhDs, as well as postdoc. And uh, half of the fellows are from Africa and the half of them are from uh, South Africa. And uh, they are sponsored by the chair and also uh, its partners from overseas as well as in South Africa. Uh, because this uh, chair has really been successful so far since its inception in 2013, so the UNESCO requested us to, ex to extend it to invite uh, other fellows from uh, other parts of the continent, uh, from the world, and that is from the South, in particular Iran, uh, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and so on. So now we are heading that, uh, that way. But it, in line with the sustainable development goals of the UNESCO, the agenda uh, SDG number six is really paramount for us within the UNESCO chair, whereby 50% of the fellows 
trained and graduated uh, would train the graduating within this UNESCO chair of Africa in nanotechnology sciences and nanotechnology are females and they are really the most uh, relatively speaking they are the most uh, dynamic and uh, uh, productive of this chair uh, in addition to this human capacity building of uh, youngsters at the level of MSc and PhD and postdoc we have also another uh, program which is extremely very robust that is the human capital mobility of senior scientists from all over the African continent and of course the south of course the north and the, the idea is uh, because in South Africa we have we are lucky to have uh, world-class type of research equipment. Therefore, uh, uh, we try to get to the maximum of our fellows from the African continent and the South to come and to spend the time with us, periods uh, between two weeks to three months to six months uh, as a senior scientist uh, uh, visiting, uh, a senior visiting scientist, whereby he or she is uh, fully sponsored uh, either via the chair or in partnership with the external funders and therefore the fellows when they come the uh, how can i say either they integrate our research programs or they bring their own research project that they conduct using all the facilities free of charge of course via the chair uh, at the itamba labs as well as unisa and its partners it was just a, a way this program has been successful in a way it has allowed us to create uh, mobility within the continent and the dialogue between us uh, in Africa. And of course, uh, uh, putting all our efforts to, uh, to, to deal with some specific problems which, do, which affect the, uh, the continent, of course, uh, also other parts of the world, but definitely uh, Africa in particular. And one of the products of this is the gain of the confidence between uh, scientists from different parts of the African continent and here as you can see a, a publication co-signed and co-authored by fellows from five different countries that is Senegal, Nigeria, Cameroon, Lesotho and South Africa and it's not limited to these countries. You can find the number of our publications with the fellows from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, uh, uh, Egypt, Sudan, uh, 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 Ethiopia and so on and so on and so on. So it is not limited to this country, but uh, these countries, but it is really fruitful and it's gaining uh, uh, dynamic in that regard. The UNESCO chair has a specific programs according to the, the uh, agreement signed with the United Nations, with the UNESCO and uh, in agreement with the host institutions that is Itamba Labs, and the University of South Africa, UNISA. Uh, our programs, uh, the ones that we are focused uh, specifically are nanomaterials for energy, nanomaterials for photonics, nanomaterials by green processing, nanomaterials for ion biomimics, and uh, nanomaterials and radiations because we are lucky to be hosted at uh, also an accelerator-based science institution that is Itamba Labs. It's a world class of uh, accelerators and uh, uh, so we use uh, these uh, uh, accelerator based techniques to uh, design, to engineer, or to characterize and uh, uh, to study a number of nanomaterials. And uh, uh, for how can I say, uh, for, the, for those who are interested by our activities, we have the five years uh, report of the UNESCO chair from 2013 to 2018. Fellows can, those who are interested to visit us or to join us for a short period, for a long period, they can uh, send me an email at these two email addresses and we will send them the full report and all the possibilities, of course, of funding to uh, visit us and to conduct uh, with us some uh, research. If you allow me to mention colleagues, uh, a nanometer, to define the nanometer scale, what is the nano? Nano, by definition, it means a dwarf, al qazam in Arabic, a dwarf, ana in Francais. Uh, that means it's very small. 
just to have an idea how small it is, and you would appreciate the beauty of the cell phones that you have, is that if you take one meter, you divide it by 1,000, it gives you a millimeter. You take that millimeter, you divide it by 1,000, it gives you micrometer. Uh, and that was in the past that we were working and we were handling the matter at that level. Now take that uh, micrometer, divide, divide it by 1,000, it gives you nanometer. It is now uh, the, at that scale that we are capable to manipulate matter. They take two atoms by atom by atom and to put them close together and to make a crystal, to take a chains of DNA to elongate them and to manipulate them in a way the distance in between them is of the order of a nanometer and so on and so on. And uh, therefore, because we have a capacity now to make, to design, to engineer, and to sculpt the matter at uh, that level, at the atomic level, atom by atom, molecule by molecule, that we are capable to embark in, in this field of nanosciences and, uh, and uh, nanotechnology. If you remember last time, uh, or generally speaking, please excuse me, uh, generally speaking, we find the nano, uh, nan a nanomaterial is defined as a nano if one of its dimension is at the nanoscale, and if it, one of its dimension is less than 100 nanometer. This is the IUPAC and the IUPAC definition of a nanometer. Any material, if it has a size smaller than 100 nanometer, that is a nanomaterial. So you can find them in a form of small particles like this one. Uh, uh, that is a nanopowder. Uh, this is, the, how can I say, uh, this is the, uh, for example, you can find these nanoparticles in a form of a paste, the titanium nanoparticles in a paste that you use to clean your teeth. Also, you can find it in a form of a, a paste to uh, uh, use it as a cream to stop the UV, that is the zinc oxide or the TiO2, titanium nanoparticles in a form of a cream that you use at, this, at the beach to, uh, how can I say, to spread on your skin to ensure that it stops the UV, so to avoid any cancer, skin cancer due to the UV or radiation of the sun. And also you can find them in a form of, uh, uh, as the second one, like a, a cheese of a Swiss cheese, uh, uh, how can I say, it's a piece of uh, a composite where inside you have nanoparticles, or you can find them in a form of uh, cigars like this, tubes, nanotubes, what we call uh, tubular systems, uh, carbon nanotubes and others. Why uh, Malik, there are long... a question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, Kossi, you want to ask the question? Yes, yes. We cannot hear you very well. I was asking when he was presented the research topics. If the topics are exper more experimental or theoretical. Both. Okay. Both. You have, how can I say, we have, uh, uh, how can I say, theoretical uh, uh, projects uh, and or you have uh, pure experimental ones and you have uh, in between, because in effect, uh, you will see, for example, it's just a pity that uh, I have not uh, included it here, but I can send you that. Uh, for example, the design of uh, uh, a solution, a drug against the COVID-19, okay. uh, uh, we were obliged to do high computational, really very uh, intensive computational modeling to find out what is the best bioactive compounds which could, which could kill, uh, uh, act uh, effectively against the COVID virus, for example. But we do, we do both theory and experimental. Okay, uh, is it clear? Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, how can I say, the carbon nanotubes like this once, are extremely very, very funny and very uh, interesting systems. You would uh, see that uh, you would uh, 
certainly in the future you will see that uh, or when well, it's, it's not the future the the uh, the uh, that uh, ah comment est-ce qu'on appelle ça la fusée uh, uh, Ketevi, can you help me please la, la fusée how can we say fusée in english rocket rocket thank you the the rockets made by uh, uh, by the spacex by spacex mainly the the major components uh, the how can i say uh, the uh, the major components are made by carbon based materials they are and in particular the carbon nanotubes why because it's carbon it's very light but these carbon nanotubes are very robust they, their strength their young modulus in a certain extent is high, higher than steel so instead to use uh, how can i say uh, stainless steel you use this one it's a light and very robust very tough and remember in space uh, technology is the weight which is extremely a problem it's not money it's the weight how uh, how heavy is the satellite how heavy is the space uh, vehicle and so on and well and last uh, last uh, talk i have uh, considered or we have considered sorry uh, uh, the uh, case of four and five whereby we have had the thin films a uh, fabri peror is on it if you remember that was in pink okay that was a fabri peror that we have through which we have shown that the neutron can tunnel if we have a certain degree of uh, uh, if we have a resonance condition and we showed also we take we took a sandwich not the one uh, a resonator but multi resonators together we stuck them like uh, a kind of sandwich and we took uh, an absorbing material and we showed that the neutron can tunnel through and uh, even an absorbing material can be transparent if if the configuration of this uh, sandwich or multi layer coating uh, follows a, a certain re resonance theory and well we came with that because uh, uh, we used the vigonogradov zeldovich uh, theoretical model to come to that result so and the same thing for here we have used the fundamental basics theoretical background of fabri perot to come with that resonance so in the previous systems we have investigated this <coughs> one and this one uh, and we have used extensively theory to come with the right configuration of both this uh, fabri perot and the zeldovich vinogradov multilayered system to observe some peculiar behavior of neutrons in these systems today we will consider this one number one and number two as a, how can i say to highlight how beautiful is quantum mechanic at room temperature with these systems uh, but please uh, uh, as i mentioned just to give you an idea about uh, when this nano has started and where it's geared to towards what well just uh, uh, to be honest to be honest there are two major dates this one 1852 by michael faraday and 1959 by richard feynman why these two well why we have to single out these two ones because it is from these dates where we started in effect to control the and to design the matter at that level but the nano has existed far before the human uh, how can i say existed in effect since the early stage of uh, life uh, in, in, on earth the magnetostatic bacteria were fabricating uh, uh, there it, they were a, a biofactory of nanomaterials i don't think that i have a time to go through it this uh, how can i say during this uh, talk but uh, just uh, to say to us just remember that nano in in uh, uh, has not been is not new but a long time ago it exists and this bacteria if you do remember that uh, any natural system any natural system does operate at the minimum of energy a high efficiency and a minimum of energy so uh, 
it the bacteria was making nano at millions and millions years ahead uh, before this major before us and uh, but the two dates that we have to consider is this one 1856 by michael faraday and uh, Richard Feynman in 1959 uh, because uh, Faraday was the first one to control more or less the size of the nanoparticles of gold. Remember gold, uh, all of you, all of us will be married one day or another. All of us will have a ring, yellow yeah, one. And uh, it happened that uh, gold is yellow when it is a bulk, but it changes its color from ruby to orange to green, uh, to yellow, to blue, to violet, and so on. Why? Because it's a plasmon effect, plasmon absorption, and uh, how can I say? And the color is size dependent and shape dependent. And the second one is 1959, while Richard Feynman, first of all, who is not a physicist by say, but he has written the best books on quantum mechanic. Uh, uh, in physics, he was an engineer and uh, a drum man, uh, but he made something outstanding. That gentleman has stated that in uh, there is plenty of room at the bottom. What he was, uh, what he was meaning by this quote here, that means uh, th there is so much interesting things if we go to a smaller level, to a, a nano, to the atom scale. And you know what? Uh, he said that uh, uh, in in the in the years 2010, uh, 20, 29, 20, 29, 1990, 20, we will be able to uh, write. What can I say? Uh, we can write uh, the entire volume the 24 volumes of the encyclopedia britannica on the head of a pin and you might you will tell me no this is a nonsense yes it is possible if you write at the, at the nanometer scale it is possible to write the 24 volumes of the encyclopedia britannica on the head of a pin and you would, is it possible for the moment yes it's not as much we cannot write this 24, but we are near to be done. And one of typical example of it is that uh, now we are capable to write at the nanometer scale, you know, to handle atom by atom and to write your name. And uh, how can I say, uh, what he was mentioning is that uh, the concept behind that uh, there is a plenty of room at the bottom is that uh, to reach that uh, level, you have to manipulate matter at a small level. That means if you want to store uh, information, you have to write to have small microprocessors or uh, large microprocessors, but uh, uh, you can store on them extremely huge amount of uh, information. And the typical case of it, it's your cell phone. Your cell phone, any decent cell phone has a, a higher capacity than the first uh, space engine Sputnik, which was sent. Uh, the capacity of any cell phone here, it's at least one trillion higher than the capacity of the Sputnik, the electronic component uh, uh, capabilities of Sputnik that was sent as early in space uh, during the space uh, revolution. And you would guess that uh, the the cell phones that you have here are far different from the ones that I have used when they came out, you see? And the, the, um, the density, your cell phones here are flat, high uh, resolution of color, high resolution of writing, and it, has, it can reach the capacity of storage of 64 gigabyte in effect it's not a laptop uh, it's not a laptop it's a computer it's a sophisticated computer that you have on your hand and you would understand that capacity you have you reach it because it's extremely small the the micro the microprocessor that are inside and the wiring and so on are very tiny at the, the nanometer scale 
and it will not, will not uh, we are not we will not be stopping there in fact you will have soon cell phones that you can roll them plastic type that you can roll them as a pen and you put it in a in your uh, jacket uh, pocket that said that is uh, mentioned so i will uh, will go to some typical examples let's go to example number one uh, we go to mercury uh, mercury colleagues if you remember is it solid or liquid at room temperature can somebody tell me if it's if mercury is solid or uh, liquid at room temperature colleagues can somebody answer the question please or take it's a guess it's it's so there. There is no trick, isn't it? Now, it is liquid at room temperature. If you take a, a piece of mercury and you throw it, it behaves like a liquid, correct? And if you use a thermometer, if it was not liquid, it will not, uh, how can I say, the, its dilatation will not allow it to, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, to, to show you the temperature. It, in a tube of, uh, a thermometer, it, go, it behaves like a liquid, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a liquid at room temperature. And it's the unique metal which is liquid. But the beauty of this, uh, of this uh, material, it was the first one. It was uh, because its peculiar property, properties that it was the first one where quantum mechanic was checked, truly speaking. So historically speaking, mercury has been uh, the element of choice for the alchemist in the past. And they were thinking, the alchemists were thinking always to try to translate, uh, to transform mercury to gold. And they were not wrong, these alchemists. In the Middle Age or even before, they were not wrong. Why? Yet, uh, how can I say, yet they were not aware about uh, Mendeleev periodic table because the mercury is close to gold. Now, colleagues, as here, as it can be seen, mercury is close to gold. If we remove some, if we manipulate the nucleus uh, of the mercury and some uh, electrons uh, surrounding it, we will be able to have an isotope which would be equivalent of gold, correct? So mm -hmm. these alchemists were not wrong. Uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, in our case, we would like to stress on the fact that mercury is unique and it was the first one which was used and in ch chemistry has helped so much in that regard to confirm the, uh, how can I say, the Schrodinger equation and, it, and its validity in chemistry in particular uh, in the case of mercury. And mercury is of an, a special interest because it's liquid, that the surface, uh, the roughness of its surface is minute. It's at the atomic level. And that's why it was used at a certain moment as a, a mirror, a reflecting mirror in the infrared by excellence. This is, you can see here. And it was, uh, um, the, in Canada, the, at the British Columbia University, which uh, they have used this telescope, and also in uh, uh, Vancouver and so on. But because a mercury liquid mirror, the roughness is so flat, so that uh, it, it does not uh, diffuse light, that's one. And second, because it's metal, it's an infrared reflector, is a perfect infrared reflector. And the other properties of mercury is that it has the highest, one of the highest, uh, it, it is the liquid which has the highest density. And that is why the uh, Archimedes law plays a huge role in this, and the surface tension plays a huge role. As you can see, the gentleman, he is in a swimming pool of a mercury and he is not sinking. He can even walk on it. He's not Jesus, but he can walk on that mercury. <laughs> uh, but as you will see, 
this roughness here nearly zero uh, at the atomic level and the, this huge density are extremely important when it comes to uh, the superstition of mercury and mercury uh, has a noble gas behavior it's close to gold and uh, surrounded by uh, thorium and gold and because because uh, uh, because it has that uh, configuration it's not easy to um, to study it because it has a noble gas behavior so from electron electronics uh, point of view and and chemi chemistry point of view it's not an easy and to explain why it is liquid you are obliged and to explain this configuration you are obliged to consider at least for the basics you take the Bohr model and you have the first electrons in the S1, S orbital surrounding the nucleus. And fortunately, that radius, okay, for these electrons surround in the first S orbital, you are obliged to consider the relativistic, uh, how can I say, correction. Otherwise, you cannot explain the this behavior of the the uh, mercury you are obliged to consider the this relativistic correction and uh, uh, and the radius how can i say the Bohr radius for the s orbital is given by that if you have to uh, and you, you have to correct this to ensure that the that the rest of the spectroscopy uh, uh, related to it, it indeed uh, is fitting within this nature here of uh, uh, of mercury so uh, uh, take i can say if one consider this uh, relativistic radial shrinkage of the one s orbital it, it uh, the same thing will uh, apply for all the s uh, the other orbitals and that is the way to explain the surface tension of uh, and these liquid forms of uh, mercury. And therefore, that was the first proof of uh, this, what we call S orthogonality. That was the proof, the first proof of the validity of the Dirac uh, correction uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, Schrodinger equation. Now, that is said, we know that uh, mercury is liquid at room temperature. And we would like to have a mercury solid at room temperature. How can we do it? Well, there are different ways to do it. There is a way that uses synchrotron or neutron uh, reactors, whereby we take a liquid of uh, uh, mercury here and that we put it between two diamonds. Okay, we put it between two diamonds and we press. We press so much that, uh, how can I say, we force the mercury to become solid. And after that, we come with the, uh, an X-ray beam from a synchrotron source or a neutron beam uh, from a nuclear uh, uh, neutron research reactor. And we probe the, this uh, squeezed mercury and we will see the fraction pattern, and we would know at what pressure exactly this mercury becomes, uh, which was liquid, becomes solid, if we see a pattern. Now there is this expensive, of course, you need to access a synchrotron, you need to access a neutron research reactor, and you need to be rich to have a diamond. And well, if we, how can I say, if you are poor, uh, uh, scientist, you can do this experimental, uh, how can I say, this experiment, you take a tube, okay, you take a tube and you fill it with the H, H, okay, the height of this tube is H, and you pour a huge amount of mercury inside, you see mercury is very heavy, yeah? it has a huge density, it's very heavy, so we can say that, uh, what, and we ask ourselves, uh, 
what will be this edge here? What will be the height of this mercury? So at the bottom, the atoms of the mercury at the bottom, which are in black here, will feel this uh, so heavy weight of mercury. So this mercury at the bottom will be solid. Okay, it's as if this mercury is under the weight of this mercury, correct? We call this a bottom mercury, and we, we call this yellow mercury, the one which is on, on it. It's so heavy, this mercury on the top, the, the amount of it is so heavy, so at the bottom here, the mercury will be under huge pressure that uh, uh, this mercury will be solid. So we will calculate more or less what is the uh, pressure at the bottom. You, if you remember, colleagues, the pressure at the bottom here is the pressure on the top, which, uh, which is the, the atmospheric pressure, if we do this in the atmosphere, plus the pressure due to this column of mercury that is rho GH. Huh? Do you agree with me, colleagues? Yes. Colleagues? That's it. Yes. So the, thank you. So the pressure here at the bottom is the pressure of air, one atmosphere, plus rho GH. Rho is the mercury uh, density, H is the height of this column. And uh, uh, how can I say? Yeah, that's it. So that is rho GH. There is a question, Ali. Sorry. Yes, sir. You want to ask a question? Yeah, thank you. So I was just wondering, like the process of forcing a liquid mercury to become a solid one by pressing it so hard between two diamonds, is that, called, is that a chemical process or a physical process? This, how can I say, it's not given to everybody to do it. So we say that because this I cannot do it, I will go to the other way to do it to do it like this to take a tube to fill it with mercury and I will say I will ask myself and I will say well if I fill this uh, with the mercury the bottom uh, the bottom tube here will feel all this pressure by, by this mercury so how can I say I will ask myself uh, what will be the pressure if the uh, sorry if this height is huge, if this height is huge, therefore the amount of mercury on the top here over the part, the part which is at the bottom will be so heavy, so this bottom here will feel a huge pressure from the top here that it becomes solid. Is it clear, colleague? Yeah, I think he wants to know that uh, the process, the phase trans exactly. transition from liquid to solid, is that driven yes. by a chemical reaction or some physical uh -huh. process? It is, uh, how can I, it's uh, the weight. It's the weight of the mercury, which is so dense that it pushes so, it, the weight, the, its weight is so huge that the pressure at the bottom here, due to the pressure on the, uh, the weight of the mercury on the top, it is so heavy and so huge that the pressure will be here uh, huge, Therefore, the mercury here will be solid. And for, the, for that, we would like to find out what is this pressure here the, that we are looking for. And for a such, uh, yeah, for a such, we have to go to this uh, phase diagram. This phase diagram is the phase diagram of mercury. Here, and that this is the pressure that I have to apply. And this is the temperature. Uh, under this uh, line here, whatever under this line, the mercury is liquid. If you, above, if you are above this uh, line, if you are above this line here, the mercury is solid, either rhomboidric alpha or tetragonal beta or hexagonal delta. Okay. And, uh, we, we are at room temperature. That is around 300 de degree Kelvin. We want to have the mercury solid. So therefore, if uh, we are at 300, we need to have it 
at least at this pressure, correct? And if I go a little bit here, I will find out that, uh, how can I say, this pressure is at nearly one gigapascal. If I have uh, liquid mercury under one gigapascal, I would have it rhomboidric here, alpha. I will be in this range. And my uh, uh, liquid mercury, will, under which I am applying one gigapascal pressure, it, uh, it will be in this, uh, in this region here, and within this line, and therefore I am in this space here, therefore mercury will be rhomboidric alpha. That means it will be solid with the symmetry uh, rhomboidric alpha. Uh, is it clear, colleagues? Yes. yes Thank you. I get you now. Thank you. Now, therefore, we have to look. Uh, we know that the pressure that we have to apply on uh, mercury must be one gigapascal. Go, let's go back to our previous graph. So we need to have here a pressure at the bottom. We have to fill the tube with enough mercury to have the pressure at the bottom here equal to one gigapascal. Okay, that is one gigapascal, remember. And to have one gigapascal here, I need to have a height H of mercury that the bottom here would be equal to rho G H equal to one gigapascal. And colleagues, if I have to do the, my calculations, rho we know it, G is 10, H, we have to calculate it, and this had to be equal at least one gigapascal. And if we do that, we will find out that H, the height that I have to fill the tube that I, for which I, I will be observing a, a solid mercury at the bottom, the H will be equal to 10,000 meters, which means that I need to have a tube filled with mercury and that tube has to be higher than, than the Annapurna, higher than the mountain of uh, uh, Annapurna in India. And because the Annapurna is 8,800 meters. And here, the tube that I need to have uh, to see that the mercury is a solid, I need to fill it with, the, I need to have a tube which has uh, this height, 10 kilometers, gosh, 10 kilometers, and I have to fill it with mercury. The, so this is impossible. This is, uh, this goes out of the brain here. It's impossible. This is a joke, isn't it? You can't do this experiment. You can't have a tube uh, of mercury with a height higher than the Annapurna. Higher, the Annapurna, I would like to mention the Annapurna is the highest peak of the, of the Himalaya mountains in India. And of course, it's higher than the Kilimanjaro in Africa. So it's impossible. So there is a beautiful way to do it. A beautiful well, Malik, way to do it. Malik, there's another question. Yes. Rashid, you want to ask? Oh, yes, uh, yes, I want to just ask this in, in, in terms of interaction between atoms of uh, liquid. I mean, atoms of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so, so, so at that scale, how they are interact. So, I'm coming back to it. I'm coming, it will okay. be, we are coming to that. We are coming to that, of course. It is at that level that it has to play, of course. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, uh, how can I say? So we are, not, uh, at least me, I am not rich, I cannot do this diamond stuff. Uh, I am not crazy for the moment that I cannot do this tube one. So I am a nano man, I have to go to nano. Now, and in the nano field, this is the beauty where, the, how can I say, where the surface tension and the Dirac correction comes in. When you are at the uh, bulky droplets of mercury, when you are at the bulky mercury, the surface tension in the, uh, is a gravity dominant. 
So the shape of the mercury droplets is imposed by gravity. But when you go to smaller uh, particles, the, the shape of the particles is surface tension dominant. It's controlled by the size of the particle phi squared instead of phi three. And it happened that we are in the ideal system because mercury has the highest superstation of any liquid at room temperature. It's a, around 500, uh, 10 to minus three SIA uh, units. And what happened at the nanoscale, it is there where you, the surface tension plays a huge role as I mentioned, and is controlled by phi square instead phi three. What happens if I take an atom in the bulk of mercury as the one that I am pointing? Do you see the arrow that I am showing? Yes. Okay. If I take this atom, it's in the inside, in the inner, it's in the volume of the mercury. So this, uh, uh, this out of mercury, uh, can, it is a noble gas, remember? Yeah, it's a noble gas. But there is, a, how can I say, there is definitely a, a surface effect. And therefore, the, the cloud, the electronic cloud here, you, you have to consider the slatter, uh, mirror, and what, what, what. But just at the beginning, at the beginning, you say that uh, because the particles, the atoms are close together, the, the electrons that repel each other, and you would have uh, uh, the electron clouds repel each other, and therefore you have a force of this one on this one, it repels this one, this one repels this one, and you would have this, and so on and so on. And therefore the net force is zero. But it is not the case for an atom which at the surface. An atom at the surface, because there is the, th the breakdown of 3D symmetry, this atom of the surface will, the net force is not zero. So there is a force which pulls it to the inside. And that's why, and each of these atoms on the surface will feel a force bringing it inside. That is the reason why the mercury becomes, or a droplet water, or a droplet of anything uh, becomes, uh, how can I say, uh, spherical. In particular, in a mercury, this force is so huge that uh, because the gamma here. Uh, so uh, we will go and find out how what would be the ideal size, whereby the pressure uh, uh, at the uh, uh, on the top of the surface is close to one gigapascal. What is the net, what what is this size here for which the total pressure on the surface is equal to one gigapascal. Well, and in effect, this is not new. This is not new. Uh, early in the 50s, 60s, 70s, in particular 70s, when the synchrotron sources became very, very robust, very intense, it was observed by Pershan in the US and for Haven National Laboratory, uh, an atomic layering. And before that, theory have showed that mercury, the atoms of mercury at the surface, they are uh, periodic. They are, uh, how can I say, there is a degree of order, ordering atom at the surface of, uh, of mercury or any liquid in effect, relatively to the inner part of the mercury or inner part of uh, any liquid, but mercury specifically. And the density, electron density has been observed, calculated, and it was shown that it is really periodic. And in effect, uh, uh, as early as the, the 50s, a uh, quarter number of theory from a Russian theorist came out and so on. And after with the Gillium model and the DFT uh, formalism, uh, also non-local pseudo potential, including the perturbation expansion of second order in the uh, second 
uh, in the pseudo potential also uh, showed that, and in particular, the beautiful work of Chacon and Gomez, which published, which was published in Physical Review B in 1992, clearly putting the the solid stone on the periodicity here, on the for the Mercury specifically, and well, in our case, we want to show this uh, order at the nanoscale. Well, and remember, how can I say? Remember what we said is that uh, if you have uh, mercury, this is the phase diagram again of mercury. If you have uh, uh, mercury on which you are exerting the surface tension of the order of one gigapascal, it will be solid. You will be in this region here, rhomboidric alpha. Well, let's do it like this. Let's ask ourselves, let me take a droplet of mercury. What stops me? I can indeed, mercury in particular, mercury is nice because uh, when you take a mercury and you splash it, it gives you small droplets, small droplets, and it comes to you, can I say, those who are govern large, they are governed by gravity, but those who are very small, they are governed by surface tension, and you can get spheres, very small spheres, as this one. So we are asking ourselves, what is this uh, radius of mercury or the diameter of mercury, droplet of mercury, which would allow me to have mercury solid? So what is this minimum size that you have, you have to have? So what I do, I go to Laplace equation, simple and straightforward. Laplace equation tells me any uh, liquid uh, circular in a form of a droplet, there is a surface tension, that droplet, uh, that liquid is in a form of droplet because there is a surface tension pressure induced on it on the surface due to the atoms of the surface, if you remember, and that pressure, delta P exerted on it, is eight gamma divided by phi. Gamma is the surface tension, we know how much is it. Uh, delta P, we know it, it's uh, one gigapascal. We are looking, what is this phi, which allows me to get uh, uh, delta P equal to one gigapascal? I make my calculations, what, 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 and I will find out that the diameter of this droplet that I need to have of mercury has to be nearly 1.3 nanometers. Okay, that is around uh, three to four nanometers. Well, so which means I need to make nanoparticles of mercury of about three to five nanometers approximately. And if I am, if I succeed to do that, I will be able to uh, have uh, an excess pressure on this particle above one gigapascal, and therefore I will be in this range. Therefore, the inside atoms of this uh, mercury will be, will be ordered, and therefore this will be solid inside the atoms will be ordered very well. And I, if I send a neutron beam on X-ray beam, I will see an X-ray diffraction pattern. Okay, fine. Now the challenge. This is the physics, this what what. Now, we have to see the engineering. And, uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the material science. Well, how we, how can I say, how we can design them? Well, you can think about uh, 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 porous glass that we call vicor glass. And this vicor glass, it's a glass, but with a huge amount of voids. And these voids, they are of the order of 10 nanometers. And you say that I will pour uh, mercury inside this uh, uh, glass, uh, this pores here. But unfortunately, remember, these pores, at least they are the minimum size that you have is 10 nanometers. And the size that we are looking for colleagues was five of the order of uh, three to five nanometers. Therefore, this porosity here cannot play, work with us. Even if we succeed, like what Sharnaya has done, the Russian Sharnaya has done, 
it has not worked. The mercury was still solid, a uh, liquid, sorry. Well, there is uh, uh, what we call ultra porous carbon host matrices. And this carbon is uh, very, very porous. And the, the porosity here is around seven nanometers. It's an open framework, but this porosity here, the black stuff here, this of the order of uh, seven nanometers. And that was Kasperovich has done. Unfortunately, because seven is above the range of three to five nanometers, correct colleagues? Therefore, it will not work. The mercury in, that we will pour inside these porosities will be still liquid. Now, let's go to another Russian because when it comes to really very, very difficult and challenging uh, experiments, I do believe really, uh, at least this is my impression, uh, uh, Russian colleagues, they are the one who go to, through it. So Kum, uh, Kumzerov, another Russian, has done an experiment and he took an asbestos from 10 to seven nanometers to uh, around six nanometers uh, porosity. You would understand that six is close to five, uh, uh, close to the range of three to five nanometers, but still above five nanometers, colleagues. Therefore, with even the asbestos, uh, the mercury was, uh, was liquid, yet it has showed a fantastic superconductivity behavior, the mercury in these systems here. But asbestos is very dangerous for health and so on and so on. So is the mercury, by the way. But in our case, we were looking to make porosity, uh, to trap these mercury nanoparticles in a porosity less than five nanometers. It has to be less than five, between the range of three to five nanometers. So this, what, uh, uh, what's her name? An MSc student uh, who would graduate also as a PhD. She, has graduated as a cum laude. And I must admit, the peer reviewers of her MSc dissertations, these fellows were colleagues from MIT and Princeton University in the US. And they are the one who gave her a cum laude. I gave an, a cum laude to an African fellow, a lady woman from Zululand, from uh, uh, unprivileged university, a rural area university, a cum laude uh, uh, by fellows from Princeton and MIT. This is a really a mark of excellence from African fellow as, as much as I'm concerned. So she came with a way to deal with it and she was, uh, she have succeeded to uh, trap nanoparticles in boron nitride matrix. Boron nitride does not react with the mercury and mercury does not react with the boron nitride because mercury, it, it has a noble gas uh, uh, structure. And uh, well, she has done it and she was able to make nanoparticles smaller than three nanometers. And in effect, uh, uh, this is what she has showed. Uh, and remember, this is a TEM, a transmission electron microscopy. Whenever she shines, the mercury starts to coalesce. You have small particles, very small particles, but when you shine with the electron uh, beam, because the, the electron beam brings heat, uh, uh, because this uh, boron nitride mercury is uh, not a very good conductor, so the heat accumulates and the nanoparticles, they coagulate fast. So to get this image was a really very challenging, very, very challenging. And what ha nonetheless, as you can see colleagues, she has obtained particles, small ones, very small ones also, and the big ones which has coalesced. And uh, you see the bar here, that is 100 nanometers. So please, uh, uh, as you can see here, so just uh, you can estimate that this, uh, some particles here are really nano, are really nano, and uh, some of them are nanoparticles, you will see. And this is what you can 
get with a little bit uh, a higher resolution, uh, better resolution, but unfortunately the particles co coagulate. As you can see here, this was a small and it attracts by a very large one. So is this one. It attracts by this one. So are these ones who are, which are attracted by this and they, co they will coalesce with this big one and so on and so on. The end of the day, here is the one that we are looking for. She has succeeded to have very small ones and you can see the facet, the facets of these nanoparticles are sharp. They are not uh, spherical uh, like this one. They are sharp. If they are sharp like this, that means there is an ordering, an atom ordering, as you can see here, as it, you can see this one, this one, and so on and so on. Wherever it's sharp interface, that means the mercury is solid. And uh, well, to do that, to have the proof of it, you have to do XRD or neutron scattering. This is it. As St. Thomas, we believe what we see. Here is the XRD profiles. Uh, I have no clue if uh, the bulk of the youngsters here participating in this uh, event have done some XRD or neutron scattering or neutron diffraction. But this is the... Uh, 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 you take a material, if uh, you take that material and you hint it by, you hint uh, that uh, substrate or uh, uh, that uh, sample by X-rays or neutrons, if the film is amorphous, that means if there is no order like this, if the atoms are disordered, the distance between them is not uh, uh, constant, you will get something like this, this profile here. The first one, the bottom one. Now, when we go for samples with the smaller sizes, okay, around the five nanometers, this is what we get. We start to have this peak here. And colleagues, it's extremely important to understand and to value this peak here. Maybe for you, it's not significant, but a dam for an X ray crystallographer or a neutron diffraction crystallographer, he or she wants more or less, she would know what does it mean here. Okay. And if we go to smaller, less than three nanometers, we start to have still that peak, this one. Okay. We have it again, but we have another one, a small one. You will see it's a small, okay, fine. But for us, it's a huge, okay. It's at the level of background, but this intensity is called, there is a correlation here. And this peak is, it has he, its own importance. So what we do, we cool down mercury. We cool it down. When we cool it down uh, uh, at the nitrogen temperature, mercury becomes a solid. When it becomes a solid, okay, when it becomes solid, it gives us these peaks. These are very strange peaks. And these peaks, they are the fingerprint of the solid mercury. In effect, if you take carbon, if you take titanium, if you take nickel, if you take gold, if you take uh, silver, whatever, copper, aluminum, if you do an X-ray uh, diffraction or a neutron diffraction, you would have peaks like this that we call Bragg peaks. And these Barak peaks, they are a fingerprint of the, ma the material. If it is copper, you will uh, identify it as a copper. If it is silver, you will say, this is the silver, this is gold, and so on and so on. So what does it mean? In our case, we have this peak here, which is the, this one, 101. And we have this peak, which is the 003 of the mercury uh, solid. So the fact that we have at three nanometers, this peak here and this peak here, that means our mercury is solid at room temperature because these ones, they were taken at room temperature, especially this one and this one. They were taken at room temperature while this one is mercury at 77 degree cells, uh, Kelvin, sorry. So because we have this and that at room temperature, or our, on our nanoparticles, we conclude that our mercury at the nanoscale 
three and five nanometers is solid at room temperature. And as it is confirmed by uh, uh, theory and the super uh, tension uh, considerations. And well, I put, how can I say, we have had to reproduce the re these results, of course, and we have to have to go through them. We reproduced them. Yes, indeed, they are, they, how can I say, they give us also this peak and that peak, peak a different, this has been run on another, uh, in another lab. So just to ensure that to confirm that these are, uh, our observation are right. And that uh, allows me to conclude that mercury is a solid at room temperature. And how can I say, we were able not to do this expensive experiment and not to do this crazy experiment of the Himalaya tube height. Is there a question, uh, colleagues? And in effect, what we have done, we have used the Laplace it's equation. Yeah, there are some questions on the chat. Yes, please. Is mercury a, spe a special, a very special case or? or? Well, uh, how can I say, we can do it on bromine. We can do it on uh, indium. We can do it on germanium. So how can I say, we, we took the mercury because, uh, uh, how can I say, the, the, the initial work of this uh, MSC fellow uh, uh, by the way, this uh, MSC fellow is the managing director of the fuel of the Kobag nuclear station that we have here in South Africa. She is the lady who is in charge of the fuel of the Newton re nuclear reactor in Cape Town here that we have. So just simply said, her aim was to find out a way to store mercury because uh, as you know in Ghana and uh, in South Africa now, in South Africa there is a huge amount of gold mining. And to traditional gold miners, what they do? The, they go to uh, old mines of gold and they use mercury and they contaminate the rivers and so on. So her goal was to find out in KwaZulu-Natal where the mortality is huge due to the contamination of the rivers by mercury. She wanted to find out a nano solution to store mercury. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can I say, to ensure that uh, you cannot put it, store it in uh, barrels and uh, these barrels will uh, corrode and so on. And they will spell again out the mercury but to have something rigid and stable like boron nitride, chemically stable. And that was the, uh, the reason for which we went through this nano solution or nano studies. But, but this experiment can be applied absolutely to, uh, uh, to germanium, to indium. Germanium can be liquid at uh, it easily is around, uh, I think, 40 degrees Celsius, it melts. So uh, you, uh, we can do the same thing for mercury. You have to go to Young phase diagram. Yeah, this gentleman has done a phase diagram for all pure materials and germanium, indium, and so on. Uh, this experiment can be reproduced for it. You are correct. Indium, germanium, and bromine. Uh, Is there another question? I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, just one, I was interested to find out like what the, uh, the, the, the material properties of the, the boron, inf the, the mercury infused boron were. Did it, was there a study that was done on them? Like, did it become like... Hello? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. No, remember, when I tried, yeah, yes, yeah, boron I tried is chemically stable. Remember, it's used in uh, harsh uh, media, chemically harsh media and uh, high temperature, high pressure tools, cutting tools. 
So boronitride is, uh, generally speaking, like the carbides, they are highly resistive to high pressure and temperature. That's why the shields of uh, uh, SpaceX and any uh, space engine, uh, the shield, the, the coating shield, the, 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 the bottom is boron carbide or boron nitride. So what happens, you are right, what happens is that the mercury, the mercury, and I'm really, I, I am extremely delighted that I am in the presence of very sharp minds, beautiful minds, participants, thank you. Uh, in effect, the mercury, uh, with, the, with the time, it, release, it releases that uh, pressure on it, on its surface, okay? And uh -huh. it gives it to the matrix, to the boron nitride matrix. Uh, do you see this uh, yellow on the top? Yeah. Yellow uh, profile? So that is the X-ray diffraction of the boron nitride. Which means with the time, with the time, the mercury releases uh, uh, that pressure on it and gives it uh, transfers it to the boron nitride, which initially was, uh, how can I say, crystalline slightly, but it becomes highly crystalline after, at the end. And as you can see, these peaks are very sharp. That, uh, what does it mean? That yes, correct, uh, the boron nitrides become highly crystalline because the, the mercury releases that pressure on it. So when, it, when you say it becomes crystalline, does it, it, does it become stronger? Is that what you say? And it becomes highly ordered. Okay. Because at the beginning it was turbostratic, which means it has some orientations like this one, like this peak, like this one here, the BN001. But with the time, uh, this peak here, this one, the B211, and these peaks here become stronger, which means the Borona tribe which was initially ordered only in one direction, the 001, mm -hmm. uh, it becomes oriented uh, highly crystalline in different directions. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Uh, if there are no other questions, I can go. Uh, uh, Hello? I have a question. Have a question. Hello? Please? Yes, yes. Okay, I, I have a question. I, I wanted to ask. Um, about uh, the physical properties. For example, I know that if you, if we begin to study materials at super high temperature pressure, their, their optical properties, for example, can change. For example, when you said the, uh, there is this high crystallinity, I know that it is somehow related with the, reflective, the reflectivity of the material. So my, my question is, apart from just getting a, a solid mercury, did you also study some other things, including optical properties uh, and, and other sort of behaviors like that on this solid? Uh, also, because I know that uh, the nanoparticles of gold also have some interesting properties, uh, either with quantum dots or ETC. Yeah. Correct. You are absolutely right, uh, except that you are absolutely right because remember uh, when we apply a pressure on a material, alternating with the, affecting their vibrational modes, therefore infrared uh, uh, and Raman uh, properties, uh, yeah. and uh, I can I say, uh, correct, the refractive index is a heavily shifted extensively in effect, and that mm. uh, involve uh, phase trans other phases, non-stable at room temperature, like titania, for example, or like mm. gold, as you mentioned. But in this case, we were really strictly focusing on this uh, peculiar behavior of mercury at, as a solid. So uh, uh, we have not investigated optical properties of, but you are absolutely right. It is true that the, all the, the bulk of the optical properties are affected. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 
but we Thank have you. not done this. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Sorry. Another question from here, please. Um, hello. Yeah. This is yes, a yes, question. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, um, actually, this question is just like kind of confirmatory question. I want to know, like, um, is it true that uh, Mercury really exhibits anomalous expansivity? Yes, of course. Remember, so, Mercury, uh, if you heat it, uh, the dilatation is uh, proportional to the temperature, and at least in a certain range. And so, how can I say? And that's the base, so, the basics of thermom the thermometer, at least from zero to one hundred degrees Celsius. So, exact. My question now is that now is there a relationship between the temperature at which it starts to, to exhibit that property and at the temperature at which it changes its phase from liquid to solid? Uh, there is the phase transition, uh, how can I say? There is the phase uh, diagram transition. The, how can I say? There is definitely a correlation between, as you can see here, is that uh, uh, here we have the pressure versus temperature. Uh, uh, as you can see, whenever you play on the temperature, in Whenever you play on the pressure here, uh, here this range of the pressures, low, pre low, uh, low pressures, it's okay, we can handle it easy. But the high pressures of around 40 gigapascal and so on, it's not an easy stuff to, to be reached. These are uh, pressures uh, that we find around in the core of, uh, of uh, our planet, you know. So, uh, uh, so, uh, I must admit, I have not really catched up the point that you want to highlight. That exactly. you want me to okay. respond me, to. Me, I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, I stand to be corrected. I guess the temperature within mm -hmm. which it exhibits that property is zero degrees Celsius to four degrees Celsius. Oh, yeah. Here, so we are in the I Kelvin. Think is quite Small, yes, you are absolutely complex. right. You are absolutely right. Here we are at 300. Uh, if we so, are, how can I say? Uh, remember at 70, we are at 300 degree Kelvin. So we are, uh, and uh, at room temperature, we are uh, less, uh, how can I say, around zero gigapascal here. So we are, our mercury is liquid. If we cool it down at 70, uh, we have a solid, uh, uh, how can I say, mercury. Even without any pressure, we have this, this uh, phase here. Okay, but uh, uh, and in between, if we cool it uh, uh, from 200 around uh, 50, uh, around 250 uh, down to 250, we will be uh, in this phase here. So it depends in what range of temperature we are. In our case, we said, is, can mercury at room temperature, can it be solid? So if we are at 300 degree Kelvin, can it be solid? If, if we want it to be solid, we need to apply a pressure. We need to be out of the liquidus phase here. Therefore, we need to be at this level, at least to apply such pressure. And this pressure is nearly one gigapascal. That is why our focus. Huh? Oh, I, okay. Um, you, uh, you said something. You said something about uh, one of the halogen elements, which is bromine. That this process could actually be repeated for could actually be done for bromine as well. So I want to I just want to confirm: is there actually a kind of correlation between the halogen and mercury? Ah, uh, you can use uh, halogens. Yeah, absolutely, you can. You can uh, liquid. We are speaking about liquid. Anyway, if we have a liquid and there is an atomic ordering, it can be applied. We have just to go and to get the phase diagram of, uh, uh, of the material in which we are interested and we go for it. In effect, I will definitely my, my go. My concern is that. Yes. Okay, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Yes, yes, okay. no, my, concern, my concern is actually that I think Bromine is strictly a liquid. 
it's not, it's, I don't think it's as if it has two phases, whether it will actually, it's will actually exhibit a phase transition to from liquid to solid. Because in that group seven, I think liquid, bromine is strictly liquid. So I was just wondering how come, like the same thing that could be done for, um, mercury could be done for bromine as well. That's why I asked yeah, that question. Let's see the phase diagram. We need to see the phase diagram. I would be delighted to continue this discussion with you uh, by email. You have my email, please send me an email and let's work on it. And uh, can I say, let's go to have the first diagram and we will work on it. And I will be delighted to invite you here to, to do such a kind of experiment. Thank you very much, Agus. Thank you. If there are... If there are no questions, uh, I, I continue if you wish. Please continue. Yeah, it's so interesting that they Thank can. You. The second case that I would like to uh, share with you is the nanoscale uh, localization and confinement. This is a really very uh, special, uh, uh, how can I say, case. Well, uh, we know more or less why the the sky is blue. We know that the uh, uh, sky is blue because uh, the scattering amplitude of the droplets uh, at a higher atmosphere, uh, the scattering is... Pro uh, remember that we have... Uh, We have mainly two major standard classical scatterings of light. That is the me scattering and this Rayleigh scattering. Me scattering and the Rayleigh scattering are all of them related to uh, the, the size of the particle diffusing or scattering. Uh, and the, uh, the scatterer and the wavelength of light or, yeah, for the moment light and the wavelength of light. When, when uh, uh, lambda is, uh, uh, when the wavelength of the uh, electromagnetic wave uh, uh, is of the order of the size of the scattering uh, of the scatterer particles, we have what we, what we say me scattering. And uh, when the uh, uh, when the uh, size is uh, it, when the size is larger than the wavelength, then we are in the case of Rayleigh uh, scattering. And I have a wave, and it will be scattered by these uh, particles. Generally speaking, the scattering is for forward. Uh, phenomena, and uh, in the case of Rayleigh scattering is uh, proportional to lambda over four, inversely proportional to the wavelength, okay? And the me scattering uh, is another regime. This is the one which controls the scattering of nanogolds and nanoparticles of gold, silver, and so on. But for the blue color of the sky, this is the one we have wavelengths coming on a particles of uh, droplets of water at the high atmosphere. And the droplets of water, they scatter that light coming from the sun. And it happened that uh, the blue light is scattered and uh, uh, by, the, by the particles of uh, droplets of water. And we have an impression, uh, in addition to the, how can I say, remember, uh, in addition to uh, the prism effect of uh, played by the droplets of water. And that's why the sky is blue, because the scattering amplitude is proportional to lambda, inversely proportional to lambda over four. Smaller is the wavelength, higher is the scattering. Higher is the wavelength, smaller is the scattering. So the wavelength, the blue, are the ones who are highly scattered Therefore, the sky is blue. Well, in addition to this uh, uh, Rayleigh and uh, me scattering, there is another one which is called the Anderson uh, scattering. 
And this Anderson scattering is a quantum mechanic uh, uh, phenomena. This has been, uh, this has been uh, 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 predicted by Anderson, Nobel laureate Anderson in 1958. And after it was demonstrated by uh, on a number of, of systems, Bosenstein condensates and so on and so on. Uh, disordered materials for laser, disordered lasers by Chow and Peng and so on. Uh, and uh, let's go back to the Anderson. What is the basic stuff of the Anderson localization? The Anderson localization that we will be uh, uh, sharing and discussing today together will be, uh, how can I say, observed on a tubular systems. Okay on these tubular systems, uh, on the carbon nanotubes. Why carbon nanotubes? Because carbon nanotubes are tubes, beautiful tubes, can be highly ordered, okay, highly ordered. Uh, you can have single or multiple uh, carbon nanotubes, and these carbon nanotubes are extremely highly crystallographically highly ordered and they can be porous inside and very long and while crystallographically ordered on the top. Well, uh, uh, let me more or less uh, go through the basics of uh, uh, the basics of uh, uh, Anderson localization. Anderson in the 50s, at the end of the 50s, has mentioned that if I send an electron, if I send an electron on a semi-disordered material, these are atoms, okay, in a solid material, and I said an and I will send an electron. This electron would be scattered by this atom. How it will be scattered? It will, it will be repelled by the external electrons because each atom has external electrons and these electrons are charged. So is this electron initial ones. So the, this electron will be repelled and it will not be attached to this electron. And so on and so on. And it will be uh, uh, scattered because the repulsion of this uh, electrons in sometimes the electron the electron can uh, how can i say can be here it is scattered once and here uh, three times and three how can i say and sometimes it can be multiple it can uh, how can i say it can see uh, and it can uh, uh, have multiple scattering okay multiple scattering. And Anderson tells us that if this electron, it has some probability that it will be scattered like this, and it can come back to the initial, initial uh, uh, scattering center. Starting from the, uh, how can I say, from the initial one, it's scattered by other, atoms and so on and so on, and it comes back to the initial one. He said that in his model, theoretical model, very intense, very robust, he says there is a probability that uh, the electron can do that. So which means it acts like, uh, uh, it, it resonates inside the disordered material. Well, and he says that according to my quantum mechanic treatment, this electron can uh, resonate in a disordered material. Fine. This uh, Anderson, a theoretician, Nobel laureate, of course, uh, has made it for electrons. But that concept of electrons cannot stop us to duplicate this phenomena to photons because uh, quantum mechanics tells me whatever is, uh, when he, uh, sorry, when he treated this uh, uh, phenomena, 
he has not treated the electron as a particle. He has treated the electron as a wave packet. That's exactly the concept that we have done last time, the previous uh, discussion that we have had uh, last time during the, uh, for the neutron. So if this phenomena can happen uh, for uh, uh, electron wave packets, it should happen, it should take place for uh, uh, photons. So, how can I say? So, uh, sorry. Um, yeah. So, uh, how can I say? Quite a number of uh, uh, colleagues have showed that, uh, in particular, this one, uh, where they considered the disordered medium, and they showed that. Uh, a, media, a disordered medium can have a lasing effect. And remember, you can have a laser effect only if you have a resonance. And up to now, laser effects, uh, up to before this uh, work, of course, of uh, uh, Shao, uh, uh, all the resonators were ordered crystals and ordered materials. But this one, uh, our work of Chao, showed that in the disordered in a disordered medium, you can have a lasing effect. And of course, uh, Maslow in 2003 have showed that you can, can do have a lasing effect in nanowires. So combining this one and that one and Anderson localization, we have demonstrated in 2007 that Anderson localization can be seen in carbon nanotubes. That is with the Professor Sienna Rao, and we have considered the two types of carbon nanotubes. Remember, carbon nanotubes are something like this, highly ordered, very long, like spaghetti, but a tube, you know, really very long spaghetti tube. And well, we took a, a, a carbon nanotubes, which are somehow slightly disordered and highly profiled. Like really, here is a, like a spaghetti boiled, you know. Uh, they are not sharp, direct, but they are not ship shaped but they are, uh, they are not tubular, but they are deformed somehow. It's like prepared uh, or boiled uh, spaghettis. While here from the other side, we took carbon nanotubes, which are really uh, uh, very nice tubes, like this one, like this one. These are carbon, which is uh, graphitic. So we have filtered, we removed this, and we kept only these ones, the tube ones. And what we have done, as you can see, we said, okay, fine. If we have only these carbon nanotubes like this one, the ship-shaped one, very long, very straight, so if we have light, light can be uh, reflecting, can be reflected by these uh, uh, tubes, uh, carbon nanotubes, and it will be reflected, and it will go, and it will see another carbon nanotubes. It will be reflected, and likely there will be another one somewhere here, and this uh, photon will be reflected, and so on, and it will come back to this one, so we'll have a resonating effect. And so therefore we will have a resonance as it was observed, as it was predicted by a Nobel laureate Anderson. So the ideal technique, and I'm sorry for, uh, how can I say to go this route, we have uh, had to use the ideal system. Uh, I would be, uh, how can I say? Uh, I would be dishonest uh, uh, not to mention that this work, otherwise I will forget it. This work uh, was done by uh, uh, a fellow from the University of Zululand, also a university from a rural area. Uh, and uh, she has done it and she was the one who observed these resonances that I am sharing with you, as you will see. And she was a master student. She uh, passed away recently, may her son stays in peace uh, uh, and well, we have had to come with the right technique. And the right technique is what we call attenuated total reflection, ATR. 
Why? Because we put the powder at the bottom here, and here we have a crystal, the ATR crystal, what we call ATR crystal, and we come with an infrared beam here, and uh, this beam here uh, 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 is reflected by this crystal, so therefore we have uh, this beam will interact extensively with this, uh, with this powder of carbon nanotubes, and therefore, if there is any resonance, we will see it at the detector at this level here. And we have to consider the right ATR crystal, the right carbon nanotubes, what, 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 what. Here, it is optics, it's electromagnetism, it's material science, it's chemistry, and is, uh, how can I say, uh, is intensive detection engineering somehow. And of course, there is a huge amount, 90% of luck. Okay. And because the, child, the experiments, they were so challenging that me, I left the lab and I left with the fellow to do the experiments uh, and to check. So what I have done, what we have done is that we have done that experiment, this one, by putting here the carbon nanotubes, which are spaghetti type. This I have done. The students have done the most beautiful one experiment that for the cheap shape of the direct carbon nanotubes. So I have done this experiment with these carbon nanotubes. She is the one who has done it with these carbon nanotubes. Well, what, because remember the Anderson localization is a quantum mechanic phenomena, so therefore, the probability to see it is really very small, it's 0 0.001, it's 10 to minus three. You can tell me, you can say, it's very low, the probability, but the probability is not zero, therefore, it is possible to see it. And I must say, during the weekend, where there are no vibrations, no automotives, no uh, deliveries and so on, so there was, uh, how can I say, the lab was free from vibration and a very good damping system. I observed, uh, I measured the absorbance, that means this intensity, at different wavelengths, at different wave numbers, different wavelengths of the infrared radiation, this one that we sent as a probe. And as you can see, I have noticed that I was lucky to see some vibrations really some fringes. And for an optical man or optical woman, they would understand there is something here. There is something fishy. And please continue, continue, never surrender as Churchill said. Never surrender, jamais ne, ne jamais surrender. And well, I have done the experiment also during that same day when I saw this, I saw something like this, but I was not able to catch it because I have had to play on the pressure and so on, uh, on the pressure, on the crystal, and repeat again the experiments and so on. But she has done so many experiments, thousands of experiments, thousands of spectra, thousands eating in the lab and sleeping in the lab. She has managed to get this beautiful interference fringe. And this is a proof of a resonance uh, in what uh, I can say. Not only she has succeeded to see it uh, in this range, when she got it like this, just she stopped it and she changed the collected the spectra, the spectrum, and she went to change the wavelength range from 3,000 to 5,000 nanometers. And she got, of course, the same one, and she got the 3,000, 5,000 one, and she got another fringes here. And these are interference fringes. And these interference fringes can be caused only by three phenomena. Either the carbon nanotubes, like behave individually like a resonator, which means if you take a carbon nanotube, it behaves like a resonator. So the 
infrared uh, light that we sent as a probe will go inside the tube and reflected by its end. Tuck, 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 multiple resonances. And you would have something like this. Or, and by the way, the carbon nanotubes, if they are single wall, there is no closure here. There is no of such a mirror or this one. So when you do these calculations, you will find out that if you consider this model here, that the carbon nanotubes act, some of them act like perfect resonators, like a Fabry Perot resonator, as in a classical optics. But uh, you will find out the contrast, contrast of these resonances, which means the minimum here to the maximum, or the minimum here to that maximum, uh, this value of the minimum to the maximum is given by the coefficient of reflection of these uh, end mirrors. And you will find out when you calculate that, you will find out the coefficient to get this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, contrast, that means the minimum, the difference between this minima and that maxima, to have this, once you have to have a reflection coefficient of around 90%, this isn't yet impossible, just out of the touch, you can't get it. Why? For the simple reason, you have just some layers of carbon nanotubes here. Let me just show, go, Ah, as you can see here, you have just some layers of carbon nanotubes at the end. If you have uh, closed carbon nanotubes, huh? and these uh, five or six layers of carbon nanotubes cannot give you a coefficient of reflection of 90 out. This is kaput, as we say in Russian. So the, this model here is out. We cannot. This interference cannot be given by uh, interference by single carbon nanotubes. So we say, ah, what if the resonances is taking place not from the longitudinal side, but transversal one side. So the light enters this side here and, and it trans uh, reflects many times and it comes out. So that means you have the carbon nanotubes like, uh, nan like this and the, the the light comes like that and, and, and it reflects many times like this. But if you do that, this is what we call Luma Gehrske interferometer. This is the predecessor of the Fabry Perot. This Luma Gehrske uh, interferometer is a very difficult to, to make. Nonetheless, it's challenging, but it's possible to make. But when you do the calculations, you will find out the interference at uh, the interfringe, we call it l'interfringe in French. The interfringe here, the space, the difference between two major peaks, two major peaks here or there, or even the smallest one, this interfringe here uh, is high, is, uh, sorry, uh, is uh, very small to give uh, relatively to this thickness here of the carbon nanotubes. So therefore, it cannot be given that interference phenomena here cannot be given by a luma gehrske configuration. Therefore, this model is out, kaput also. The unique possibility is to say, ah, this uh, phenomena, sorry, this phenomena can be given only by a resonator which consists of uh, a, a set of carbon nanotubes reflecting you, uh, the beam, send this one like that. It is reflected by this one, goes that side, reflected by this tube, reflected by this tube, reflected by this tube, reflected by this tube. And uh, from the width, from this interference here, uh, you calculate the difference between Sorry, and you will find out uh, that uh, the length of this cavity, which gave you birth to this uh, 
uh, interference, it has around a length of around 47 micrometer. And this is possible, yes, indeed. It is possible to have uh, in a, such a system a, such a resonator. Therefore, this is a pure, how can I say, this is a pure uh, understand localization. In addition to that, in addition to that, let me just come back to the model of a, 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 a strong understand localization. It tells us the transmission or is proportional in an exponential way to uh, the, the thickness uh, to the length of the, uh, of the cavity. Exponential, huh? please colleagues. Here, at St. Thomas, we believe what we see. Here is the absorbance. It's proportional to the, inversely proportional to the transmission. And as you can see, versus the wavelength, the decay is in an exponential here. Therefore, this is Anderson localization, room temperature, Anderson localization in carbon nanotubes. And this, as I mentioned, it's a very, very difficult phenomenon to be observed. And quite a number of colleagues went to investigate it and so on. And uh, these are not really, how can I say, those who uh, try to investigate this phenomena are uh, uh, ever Nobel laureates like uh, Sir Neville Mott and Anderson himself and uh, quite a number of uh, fellows in uh, Nobel groups, like this one where Laberry is, where Kaiser and Miniatura is, uh, and so on. So this one has been done by yet, uh, it's really sad that uh, the paper came out, we, me as a first author, I do not deserve the late, Tammy Malungu deserve it. She is the one who has obtained this very nice result so far on the carbon nanotubes. And I think, uh, uh, dear uh, Chair uh, uh, Prof Ketevi, uh, how much I have still? If I don't have, I stop here. Uh, yeah, I think we are past. Uh, we can, we can, uh, you know, add uh, a fourth lecture for you. Uh, uh, later on, uh, but we, yes. yeah, we, we have now, uh, so we've had, you know, two hours now. So I think we can stop here if there are more questions and then, Thank you. and then we arrange. Uh, so you have another lecture next week. Okay. And then if necessary, we will arrange a fourth one. Okay, please, if, uh, okay, thank you so much. And the, I'm uh, grateful to you and I'm really grateful to, uh, to the young uh, participants for their, uh, inputs in terms of bromine and uh, other aspects. I will definitely consider. Thank you so much and have a nice day. But let's see whether anybody has any question, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, on the Anderson localization. Maybe there are some people with questions. Sure. Yeah, I just, I just have a basic question. I was, uh, so you said that uh, the, the 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 the, the movement of uh, of electrons within the material was to, the, the electrons were treated as a uh, a wave packet, Correct. and that's the same same it's the same uh, treatment that was used in the in the in the previous lecture that you gave. So now yeah. like, I was just wanted to find out like what the difference between scattering and refraction is. Then. Well. Uh... Uh, reflection is a specular, uh, is a specular scattering. So uh, while uh, scattering in general sense of the word, it's when a particle is uh, scattered. Okay, when, when the particle is uh, scattered by a, 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 scat a scattering center. Yeah. And if this scattering direction is uh, very well defined, we call it reflectivity, we call it transmission. It, it depends on, uh, how can I say, uh, if it depends if, if it is specular or non-specular. No, uh, not, not reflection, refraction. Ah, refraction, yeah. yeah. Okay, refraction, also it's, also it's a, a form of a scattering, 
but okay. in a very well defined direction. Okay. okay. Any other questions or comments uh, in particular on the Anderson localization? That was really, really, I think, uh, uh, Professor Manik Maza, this is a really impressive result first, and congratulations to, to you and, and uh, the students and postdocs who achieve uh, this impressive result. And I am not in nanoscience, but I understood most, you know, most of the things that you explained today is really, really nice. I have to say uh, congratulations. Thank and you. also for explaining in such a comprehensive uh, way, um, I think that was really, really good. Thank you, uh, thank you, dear chair. Uh, any, any other, any, anybody else has any other questions or comments? Or? Uh, if not, so what I would suggest uh, Malik is that uh, next week, if you want, uh, you can start from this, uh, item number three, uh, the tunable uh, surface tension. And then you go with, uh, and then you, 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 you go into the lecture that is planned for next week. And then um, if necessary, we will we'll arrange a fourth lecture for you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Um, there may be, I think, yeah, there's no more. I don't think there's, yeah, there's no more. Uh, there's no more uh, question. Christine, is there anything you want to say? Uh, no, just uh, to resonate as well with the students who are just mentioning that this is a great session, that it's very, very interesting and motivating. And I hope that you will have a, a lot of additional follow as well, working on your side for, as you said, ne jamais se rendre. I really like as well this expression. Perseverance is really what we have as well to teach, to make sure that uh, the future will be well-oriented, and potentially as well to use artificial intelligence to be able to, uh, to, to digest faster, maybe all those results. Mm. Yes, yes. In effect, how can I say? I just wanted to uh, conclude by saying um, the future of uh, nanosciences, because it's multidisciplinary, because it involves uh, uh, physics, chemistry, life science, computational modeling, and so on, it, it makes, uh, it prepares the fellow uh, uh, for, uh, how can I say, in a better way and uh, in an open mind, really an open mind. For example, we have just deposited a patent on using, uh, uh, how can I say, nuclear technique, believe it or not, nuclear technique to make some uh, nanoparticles of uh, an outstanding qualities. I mean, the, the papers are, uh, came just recently in Nature Scientific Reports. Uh, really, uh, uh, the field of nano and uh, uh, accelerator science, so nuclear sciences, uh, they can really, they, they, there is a really momentum in between them and there are bridges. But what is sure is that uh, artificial intelligence will, it is a hit on us and it is here and it will be boosted extensively extensively and fa very fast. And uh, any artificial intelligence uh, on a human being will be through the nano. We will have chips. I can assure you we'll have chips implanted instead to have our IDs and so on. And these chips, uh, how can I say, will be uh, dense enough in terms of microprocessors and so on. And this density comes with a price. And that price is a nano, very small. So, it, how can I say, uh, artificial intelligence and, and nano, they will go uh, uh, together. Exactly, for the, the next innovation. Oh, yes, so oh, yes. Excellent. All right, uh, so great. So, I, um, I, will stop, I will suggest that we, uh, we stop there. Uh, thanks again, Thank Professor you. Malik Maza. This was really impressive. Mm -hmm. Uh, both in terms of the results and the presentation that you have given us today. So we'll have the pleasure to have you again next week. And then if necessary, we'll arrange uh, a fourth lecture. Thank you. Thank so you so thanks much. Everybody. And for, uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, taking your uh, precious time to hear me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Later.